Qualis Valerian, the man, the sea snake, the legend, the black dude which fills my comment section with love and understanding. Yeah, because changing the color has such a huge impact on the story of the world. It's a fantasy show. Fantasy back. Get a grip on life. Black people now. Black people now. Oh, just question. The summer islands very much. His mum could have been black. It's always funny when white supremacists are trying to connect with characters. Get a life and just watch the damn show. This is too much. Yeah, she was born to take the place. So I can't wait until the white authors have a mix of kids. So you can bitch about this in real life. Oh, you can smell the shit from five miles away. So, yeah. And these are the good guys, right? Like, the, the woke people of the understanding, treat everyone equally, and, you know, like, how you want to be treated, people, right? right? Am I getting them mixed up with Nazis, or is it just in me? Are we the baddies? <laughs> Nah, it was probably just me, right? I'm clearly the reincarnation of Hitler. After all, I did say in the last video... Um... The fuck did I say in the last video? So, yeah. There's legitimate non-Valerian descent in the bloodline there that could explain this. His mother could have also not been Valerian. Ah, yes, how silly of me to forget. I said that his grandmother was a Macy, and we don't know who his mother is, so... Technically speaking, there's no reason that Chorus Valerian can't be a black dude. So, um, why am I a racist and a white supremacist again? I'm confused. He's a monster. It's terribly forgetful of me, I do apologize. <laughs> You'd think I'd remember something like that. Ah, it was probably that time I said that really racist thing in that interview one time. Uh, wait, no, that was the showrunners. Though in fairness to them, they did say that they didn't want it to feel like an afterthought, or worse, tokenism. So you could argue their hearts are in the right place. If you weren't a cynical asshole like I am. If you are a cynical asshole like I am, you could probably argue that it likely wasn't even their decision in the first place. It was probably just ticking boxes. And probably the fact that we can explain it within law is most likely just a coincidence. But at least I can explain it within the law, so it's fine. It could be worse, after all, we could be Lord of the Rings. <laughs> there's, uh, there's no explaining that. But time will tell whether or not they bother are actually explaining this stuff in the show. Like, I don't know, introduce the sea snake's mother, perhaps? Is she a MILF? These are the highly important questions I, for one, want the answers to. Well, that, and the most burning question is, who cleans up the dragon's poop? Seriously, what poor fucking sod has the job of cleaning up the dragon pit? That's what I want to know. My hat, for one, goes off to those poor unfortunate bursters. But in fairness, try to understand this from the view of people who have been shafted by Star Wars, Disney, fucking Marvel, Amazon, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> That's how you do an evil laugh. Ciao for now. But hey, who the fuck am I kidding? Understand? <laughs> One glance at YouTube comments will fucking tell you how much people understand each other. Ah, the milk of human kindness. It's a fucking bitter, bitter thing. Here I am, waffling on about the state of humanity, and there's those 20 people in the comments section calling me a racist fucking isphobe. Whatever the bloody hell that means. <laughs> it's almost, ladies and gentlemen, bear with me, as I perform some mental gymnastics that may be difficult for you to follow if you've a tiny pea brain. But these fuckers didn't watch the video. Or, they're mentally impaired. Whichever one it is, it doesn't matter because there's no way in hell they've made it this far in the video. The legends say that if you listen carefully, you can still hear the furious typing of their keyboards. Everyone, just be quiet for a moment. Just a moment of quiet. Did anyone else fucking hear that? Did anyone else fucking hear that? Apparently, ladies and gentlemen, just having one segment for the Sea Snake was not enough. We need a whole lore video. Welcome to that lore video. Also, I mostly just wanted to take the piss out of the comments. That's basically why we're here. God forbid people fucking watch a video before they form an opinion and just spew it into the comment section like a bunch of fucking clowns. But who am I to deny the mama his farce? Step with me, dear viewer, once more into the fray. <laughs> Uh, I can't do this shit with a straight face, dude. It's too funny. Uh, everyone's losing their crap. I'm just saying it like, this is fucking great. I should do more of these videos. Hold on to your butts. Corlys of House Valerion, Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark. Renowned in song and story as the Sea Snake, and surely one of the most extraordinary figures of his age. A noble house with storied Valerian lineage, the Valerions had come to Westeros even before the Targaryens if their family histories can be believed. 
Settling in the gullet on the low-lying and fertile island of Driftmark, so named for the driftwood that tides brought daily to its shores, rather than its stony, smoking neighbour, Dragonstone. But though never dragon riders, the Valerions had for centuries remained the oldest and closest allies of the Targaryens. The sea was their element, not the sky. During the conquest, it was Valerion ships that carried Aegon's soldiers across the Blackwater Bay, and later formed the greatest part of the royal fleet. Yet even with such forebearers, the Sea Snake was a man apart, a man as brilliant as he was restless, as adventurous as he was ambitious. It was traditional for the sons of the Seahorse to be given a taste of the seafarer's life when young, but none before or since took to the shipborne life as easily or as eagerly as the boy who had become the Sea Snake. He first crossed the narrow sea at the age of six, sailing to Pentos with his uncle. Thereafter, he made such voyages every year. He climbed the masts, tied knots, scrubbed decks, raised and lowered sails, manned the crow's nest. His captain said they had never seen such a natural sailor. At the age of 16, he became a captain himself, taking a fishing boat called Cod Queen from Driftmark to Dragonstone and back. In the years that followed, his ships grew larger and swifter, his voyages longer and more dangerous. He took ships around the bottom of Westeros to visit Old Town, Lannisport, and Lordsport on Pike. He sailed to Lys, Tyrosh, Pentos and Myr. He took the summer maid to Volantis and the summer islands that could well serve as the home for the sea snake's mother, whose origins are at present unknown. For the summer islanders are a dark people, black of hair and eye, with skin as brown as teak or as black as polished jet. A handsome people, tall, strong, graceful and quick to learn. All qualities that drew plenty of pirates and slavers from old Valeria and the Basilisk Isles. The summer islanders took to the seas at the dawn of days, in graceful swan ships with white sails and impenetrable hulls, crewed by archers wielding golden heart string bows, weapons prized by princes and kings, for no bow was as strong or could shoot as far, aside from those crafted of dragonbone. A summer islander's love of the sea is matched only by their loves of gods and goddesses, those of love, beauty, and fertility. If there were a god of tits and wine, Tyrion Lannister would find them here. In the summer isles, they worship the fertility goddess with 16 teats. You should sail there immediately. And then the Sea Snake went upon the Ice Wolf, north to Bravos, east watch by the sea and Hardhome, before turning into the Shivering Sea for Lorath and the port of Ibn. On a later voyage, he and the Ice Wolf headed north once more, searching for a rumoured passage around the top of Westeros, but finding only frozen seas and icebergs as big as mountains. His most famous voyages, however, were those he made on the ship that he designed and built himself, the Sea Snake, perhaps taking inspiration in its design from the swan ships of the Summer Isles. Traders from Old Town and the Arbor oft sailed as far as Calf in search of spice, silk, and other treasures. But the Sea Snake were the first to go beyond, passing through the Jade Gates at Yai Ti and the Isle of Leng, returning with so rich a load of silk and spice that he doubled the wealth of his house in a single stroke. On his second voyage with the Sea Snake, he sailed even further to a shy by the shadow. On his third, he tried the Shivering Sea instead, becoming the first Westeros Sea to navigate the Thousand Islands and visit the bleak, cold shores and the Guy and Mosovi. In the end, the Sea Snake made nine voyages. On the ninth, Sir Corlys took her back to Calf, laden with enough gold to buy 20 more ships and load them all with Strathon, Pepper, Nutmeg, Elephants and bolts of the finest silk. Only 14 of the fleet arrived safely at Driftmark and all the elephants died at sea. Yet even so, the profits of that voyage were so vast that the Valerions became the wealthiest house in the Seven Kingdoms, eclipsing even the High Towers and the Lannisters, albeit briefly. The Sea Snake put this wealth to good use. When his grandfather died at the age of eight and eighty, the Sea Snake became Lord of the Tides and Castle Driftmark, a grim and dark place. And so the Sea Snake raised a new castle on the far side of the island. High Tide was built of the same pale stone as the Eyrie. Its slender towers were crowned with roofs of beaten silver that flashed in the sun. Beneath the dark, salt-stained walls of Castle Driftmark, three modest fishing villages grew together in a thriving town called Hull, for the rows of ship holes that could always be seen below the castle. Across the island, near High Tide, another village was transformed into Spice Town usurping much of the shipping lanes from King's Landing and Duskendale, both towns serving as home to the Dragon Seeds, a term used for bastards with dragon blood in their veins, such as Adam and Alan of Hull, and the girl Nettles, to name but a few. And the Sea Snake's house grew even richer and more powerful. Lord Corlys was an ambitious man. During his nine voyages on the Sea Snake, he was forever wanting to press forward. 
to go where none had gone before, and see what lay beyond the maps. Though he had accomplished much and more in life, he was seldom satisfied, as the men who knew him best would say. In Rhaenys Targaryen, daughter of the old king's eldest son and heir, he had found his perfect match. A woman as spirited and beautiful and proud as any in the realm, and a dragon rider as well. His sons and daughters would soar through the skies, Lord Corlys expected, and he thought how one day his blood would sit the Iron Throne. This war is far from over. 